The separation of talent and skill is one of the, 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 the greatest misunderstood concepts. There's no easy way around it. No matter how talented you are, your talent is going to fail you if you're not skilled. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Skill Science Podcast. This is Dr. Raj again, and I'm joined by PD Webb. What's going on, bro? How much I'm uh, enjoying a nice fall Sunday. Um, wonderful time. Uh, a lot of basketball in the air. Yes, it is. And then, you know, it's better to get a lot better because today, this week's topic is something nothing near and dear to both of our hearts that we both smile a lot when we talk about this player, uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander. And specifically, we're going to be talking about what we call his elongated step, how he uses that very, very lengthy step and how that unlocks his game. And we'll, we'll be doing, going into, as we always do, into the underlying fundamentals behind that, why it's so unique, applying other context to it, and then how you can potentially even train that when, within yourself or other players. But first things first, we want to define some key terms. So PD, you're a I'm going to define a couple of terms and I'll, I'll define a couple of terms myself as well. I think that that one of the key terms that that sort of is central to me when talking about this concept is, is degrees of freedom or degrees of like movement range. Um, it's just how far you can actually stride out. So many players who could potentially have really large elongated strides struggle to have their hamstrings loose enough, you know, have uh, have their, you know, uh, elasticity in their spine just can physically do these elements regardless of, of having the coordination or being able to do them at game speed, but just the flexibility and, and you know, fine motor uh, abilities to functionally, you know, reach forward and cover six, seven, eight, nine feet in one stride. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that's so unique about with degrees of freedom, it's kind of looking at how many independent variables you can control, right, in and of itself. And, and Shea is able to control a bunch of variables for a number of different reasons, right? Part of, like you said, is that elasticity of the spine. Part of it is the hamstring uh, elongation as well. So that some of those physical traits are what allow him to have that control over those degrees of freedom. All right. And I know there was, there was another one you wanted to talk about, which was uh, you had called motor adaptation, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, um, uh, sort of, a, a, your brain doing what your body wants it to. It's a little bit different than, than proprioception, which we talked about last week. Um, which is just like, can your body coordinate when things get a little bit weird? Um, so when, uh, one or two variables on the floor, um, you need to quickly react and then execute. Um, this would be your, your, your brain's ability to send that signal and your body's ability to react to it and, and, you know, course correct over. Um, so the defender jumps to the right, you quickly have to plant, plant and move to the left. Um, there is a processing component of it, but there's also like a brain sending the message to your body and your body being able to execute. Yeah. So essentially, you know, how, how well your body can adapt movement to, to spontaneous variables, right. That, that, that creep up how quickly and effectively, of course, like you said, there's so many different layers to it, starting at the processing and then the outputs are often physical. And for myself, what I want to talk about was a couple uh, terms. First is something we call, it's a biomechanics term called a stretch shortened cycle. This is in general, when you do a certain move in a certain manner, it's going to load certain tendons and muscles and stretch them out like a spring. And then when you go in the opposite direction, you're going to, it's going to release that energy at a very high rate. So this, this, um, Short cycle is critical for explosive movements. Like when you see guys, for example, who are up on the ball of their foot, that Achilles tendon is loaded. It's stretched out like a spring. And then when they jump, it contracts with, with more force than it would if you were on just, you know, if you were flat footed, right? So these are little, little things, but they lead to increasing those margins. And as you know, with the NBA, it's very, very small margins. And so with Shea, we see him use this elongated step in certain ways to get himself into better mechanical positions and be able to kind of explode through it. And then the second aspect I want to touch about was, we weren't sure what to call this. I called this the route tree, or we were also talking about calling this kind of you know pattern variability. But essentially, 
you know, it's almost like a wide receiver when they're on their route, they take five steps and then they can go in any direction that they want. Right. It's almost, it's, and so the better you're able to, to, to do that setup and then break into these other branches, the more questions you ask the defender, the less the defender can read on you. And therefore it leads to more deception. And so with Shay, that's, that's something that we'll talk about kind of as well moving forward with, with this move in particular. And so generally when you see this kind of elongated step, what is kind of going through your mind PD in terms of like what enables him to do this or, you know, just kind of just defining that, that step in your brain, you know, what's your thought process when you're seeing it? My thought process is that it is a reactive move to it is a it is basically like a, a counter punch um, in finishing where you've set something up first. So usually uh, it's it's a it's a small step to your right and then countering with the big to your left to, to find a finishing window. Um, it's essentially a way of framing your finishes. And to me, when a person has or when a player has multiple different elongated steps so you know there might be like the ultra long one like Giannis has a particular one he knows that he can get a dunk but he just like really reaches out um Mm -hmm. similar to the the, you know the seminal scene in space jam but for legs um (laughs) and uh and so like what I'm sort of seeing is is a player thinking through finishing angles but before they even get to the finish they're thinking through you know how can I get to the finish that I want how do I set that up and then this is the my way of, of covering to that finish um and really that that's uh, you know a, a high level thinking of the game, high level court mapping, uh, but also just like it is an extremely difficult thing to teach because it requires being of multiple minds at the same time about thinking where players are on the court, about thinking about how you're selling a move, thinking about how you're moving in space, and then you know think about how you're physically going to pull it off. Um, that's a lot of things to do, and you're usually talking about um, an extraordinarily coordinated individual. And that's even before we talk about like actually finishing the ball. This is just things that count for zero points. So it's, it's a, it's a mixture of really like high level, uh, skills. And if, if you were to think of this in terms of video games, these are all like the top of the skill tree stuff. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, to your point, the concept, right. When you're, when you're driving savers defender is simple. I want you to you know attack a certain space and how do I get into that space? And so He's then using that elongated step to be able to more effectively get into that space how he wants it wants to right and create that space. But like you said, there's so many underlying variables that kind of go into that skill of the elongated step. I think for for a layperson when they first see it, just physically, like how is this dude at six six able? to do this movement with such fluidity, with such mobility, right? Just from a visceral standpoint. And, you know, when I see him just from a physical standpoint is that his ability to manipulate with his mobility in terms of whether it's his hip, his trunk flexion, his ability to get low, his ability to extend out with those legs. Like that to me is the first thing that really, really jumps out just from a physical perspective and then, you know, underlying that are some of the things that we've talked about kind of in the last, in episode one, we defined, right? Which is the proprioceptive ability, the neuromuscular ability for him to, his brain to understand his body shape and then be able to trigger all these movements for his muscles to activate in the right way as he gets into that elongated step. And then lastly, is just the balance. Just if, if, if you're listening to this, just put yourself into that position that you see in some of these clips, you know, that, that we've shared. It's not an easy position to be in, right? And so it, it requires a lot of body control, a lot of strength, great balance and all those things. You know, for you, kind of getting back to that point of what are you seeing from more of, let me just say, like the, the neural, like the nervous system parts of it? I think it's the planning element that I would really like to focus on. Like there is a reactive element, but just knowing where you need to step, sort of having a a mental picture of how far a player needs to go to get, like to take, get the finish they want. So, you know, if it's a goofy foot, you know, if it's a goofy foot extension, you know, you have certain angles that are, will, are basically unblockable if you time them correctly. 
Um, if you're trying to, to get a sneak finish off two, then you're mm-hmm. going to be wanting to move more forward. So I think that mentally it's, it's picking a spot, sort of picking a finish, reading the defender all at the same time. So it's at the, in a lot of ways, the physical element is the easiest part because you can mm-hmm. do all, you can do the physical, like we see it, I, most of my uh, time is spent on draft and on, on, you know, scouting high school and college players. And you see a lot of players who physically can take these really elongated steps, but they don't know how or when to do them. So you kind of find them button mashing where if in, in where with Shea, you never feel like he's taking a misstep because he has so many unique counters and so many um, unique tempos to play at. He's able to get to the spots he wants to and, and, and position the defense, frame the defense as he, as he really dictates that tempo where younger players are much more reactive. And so the mental aspect for me is balancing all of the requirements to get to this finish versus the actual step itself, which I think more players meet that threshold, but make giving it ultimate utility is, is the, the real difficulty. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I love the way you framed it. Cause I want to kind of get to the point where, you know, the viewer is seeing something at like the physical, but that's really just the superficial part of it. We're not seeing what goes behind it. And that's what we're trying to really deconstruct with Shay, you know, and these podcasts is what goes into that planning behind it. And, you know, what I really see with him, like you said, is manipulating his, his, his step cadence, right? His, he can take so many different step lengths, right? This is just the ultimate one that he uses really effectively to attack space so well. But when you watch him with his cadence, when he attacks his step length, He's able to manipulate it so effectively. And that comes really back to that route tree we talked about. Like some players might only have three branches off that trunk, right? This guy has like unlimited branches. So what do you do as a defender? It's very, very difficult. He's able to manipulate his step, right? He's able to manipulate the angles he steps at, right? He's able to manipulate how quickly or slowly he's taking that step. And he does all these things. I mean very, very quickly from the processing part. And so that's what you're really getting to in terms of, I felt like that to your point about understanding before he ever even takes the step, that's just, you know, the the tip of the iceberg, whereas everything else that goes underneath it is really, you know, the the true, I would say the skill behind that step. Yeah. um, I think that for a lay person, I think the best way to, to, experience this is to watch a player who maybe has a more limited um you know final two steps as a finisher i would suggest like college rj barrett as a really good example um youtube has a function where you can watch the like just go to you know rj barrett highlights and turn the turn the speed as low as you can and try to guess the footwork pattern when he picks up the ball and just do this for 10 times. I mean, usually he's going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, right, left, and the tempos are pretty similar. He mostly used his strengths, but he, he had long strides. But I think if you do this for a couple of minutes, you'll be able to predict how he's going to step, what the distances are going to be. If you do the same thing for like a Shake Gilgis Alexander finishing video, um, you're not, it will take you so long to be able to be like, okay, so he's leaning this way. I think it's right, left, uh, slow, fast. And then he'll do something entirely different. So I think that that's the best way as a layperson to sort of understand is try to put yourself in the position of a defender trying to make a split second decision. We obviously can slow it down uh, and processing it at NBA speed is, is incredibly hard, but it will give you an idea of or an appreciation of what that feels like uh, as a defender to look at that and try to guess. And for lesser, less variable finishers um, or, or less coordinated or, or optional finishers, um, you'll be able to pick it up fairly quickly and, and understand what makes them take and what exactly they're looking for when finishing. Yeah. And then let's say you're a defender and high level defender, and you're able to process these things quickly. You know, what Shea will then do, he'll use the elongated step and then go into a step back off of it. Right. So he, ha- he even has an additional counter or counters to that. And you know, there was a clip that we looked at prior to the show. And I think he, he went baseline. He did that elongated step and, you know, fools the defender goes back into a step back quickly into his shot. And it's not just fooling the defender, but that elongated step, it's something that going back to the topic we defined at the top was a stretch shortened cycle. When he's in that elongated step and his quads and hamstrings are loaded, that actually allows him now to create 
that stretch shorten cycle and more and more efficiently actually step back for a quicker explosion, right? And so that makes it even harder for the defender. If let's say even if they have read that he's going to do a step back, even if they read it, that mechanically for him allows him to still step back quicker than them and get that shot off. So there's so many different layers and advantages to that step from a mechanical perspective as well. And I think one thing we haven't touched on in that regard, which I want you to touch on, is when he does take that elongated step, it may even give him a little bit more time to be able to read what the defender is doing because he has a little bit more time between a normal step length, right? Yeah. And it also is an opportunity to regain an advantage. Um, mm-hmm. Shea uh, is, is a wonderful athlete pretty much across the board with the exception of strength. Um, but he's, he's gotten stronger, but he's just yeah. a guy who's going to have some difficulties with the PJ Tuckers of the world. And when they get close, these elongated steps can give him a moment to regain advantage and now peek around and be like, okay, so is anybody going to help over? What can I see? And he has the stability where he can leap out of these if he has to abort um, whether it's just like on, he does a first elongated step and can just die into a floater, which is insanely hard, um, or you know, taking huge or small first step, elongated second step, and then going looking for a jump pass to a, to a kick out. Um, these are opportunities to read, but it also just is small moments where the players who you would expect to give them trouble may it's a micro advantage that could be available to them. So there are so many, um, you know additional benefits to to having these sort of unique tempos in your game um and being able to leverage each little part of it um that that we've gone across and and, you know we've covered quite a bit in just this little you know this little moment but shay creates that well in basically every single part of it um there's not really like a weakness in in the way that he gets downhill other than the fact that he's not like john morant leaping but it's made up from the fact that his you know arms are super long and he's again he's six six like uh if like six, six people are not supposed to move like this. He's one of the few guys who you forget how tall he is until you like see him around or see him standing next to like a normal human being. And it's like, Oh no, this is truly insane. Yeah. Like, I mean, other guys who kind of get into that similar position are much shorter, like with, with that lunge for it, you want to eight step and he not even to that extent, like Kyrie does it to an extent. Um, Kemba does it to an extent on their step backs only. Right. But he's Shay's able to do it at six, six, into that elongated lunge forward position and then go off of it in multiple ways. Whereas most other guys only use it as a change of direction component. He's does it in every direction component, which is kind of, which is pretty incredible. And it allows him, like you said, to kind of, you know, give him that extra micro advantage, you know, in my head, it's almost like he's already seen the game in slow motion with that extra elongated step and more time, he's almost seeing the game in like that XMO, that, that, that super, super slow mo. And so it gives him that extra microsecond to make, to, to get more information and then make that decision. And so I think we've talked a lot about kind of the, the actual step itself. I think, you know, the last thing that, that you know, me and PD really want to talk about is how do you potentially train this in yourself? or your athletes. So let me start here because I can, I'll do the more kind of simple aspect, which is the, the physical component. And then PD will kind of get more into kind of what we call it, like the spontaneous, what goes behind it. So, you know, the, the biggest thing you see with Shay physically for me is that, is that mobility factor, him able to just get into these positions and control those positions and so a lot of stuff that I work on with players who, who want to play this way is firstly, simply balance, dynamic balance. So you, your body has to be able to balance yourself when you're in these kind of unstable positions, right? So that's training, training base. Secondly is, do you have the functional mobility, whether it's hamstrings, whether it's at the trunk to be able to get into that position, right? And then I think lastly is just pure strength. Just if you try to hold, if you're in that position, can your quads really hold you in that position? Can your back leg able to withstand that position, you know, consistently over the course of a game? So it's a lot of it's working on what we call eccentric strength, which is really how your muscles are controlling your body. And of course, along with that comes neuromuscular control, involves balance and all of those things. Now getting kind of to the side of, let's say PD, you had a 
athlete come to you that can physically get into this position, right? How would you then go about training them in a manner to, of course, no one, you know, Shay's an outlier, but how would you go to try and move them towards his ability to, to spontaneously do some of these things? I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so the way that I kind of think about these sort of uh, skills and, and movement patterns is you have the first step, which is just learning the basics of the movement, um, you know, learning the why and the when of it. So this is the input, here's the output, here's what your body should do. This is the general timing. Um, the second one is just reproducing it. Um, so, you know, you, you go into a block setting, the defender moves to the, you know, the defender's in the middle, you take one step to the right, and the second step is to the left. And you probably would want to start without the ball just because uh, it gives people more freedom mentally. Um, you know, I find that, especially when it comes to like freedom of movement stuff, um, which is, you know, hips and shoulders and just like a looseness, giving younger players a basketball uh, just tightens them up. Uh, they go to more comfortable movement patterns. Um, and then the third step is ideation. And this is, I think, where uh, training has had some problems with this specific movement pattern is that we will do a lot of the block stuff and, and do it you know, at, at different tempos, maybe out of different situations. But we don't make unfair situations for players to have to solve themselves and sort of like flip what they know into a into a the best solution possible for a very sloppy situation. Um, so when we think of, of players practicing Euro steps, it's sort of them dribbling down from, you know, the, the volleyball line, taking three dribbles, the defender picks a side and you go. And like that will work to a point and then it loses its plasticity. Um, a, a player solves it well enough, but it doesn't necessarily replicate the challenges of a game where you may not get to stare at a defender for four seconds. So there are a lot of uh, ways to make things unfair for a, a, a player who's moving up the diff or the, the competency ranks. Um, so whether that's uh, giving unique starts, like uh, a player has to start falling forward um, where they have to catch themselves and that's their first step and figuring out how they're going to solve the second step. So they have a little bit of, do I want to, you know, fall with the left, do I want to fall with the right? Um, those are, those are certainly options. Um, we, uh, you can uh, force unique syncopations where the coach or, or, or trainer or what have you is yelling fast, slow for every step or, or, you know, giving, calling out one of the steps and the, the player gets to pick the other. Um, but the most important thing is, is forcing player centric conclusions. Um, when, when you force a, you know, a templatized prompt, everyone's sort of going to do it the same and building circumstances where players can experiment with tempos, experiment with mistakes that they will actually make in the ways that they often do. Um, I think that the, the biggest problem that, that block training when it comes to this sort of movement style is that it doesn't reproduce the decisions that have caused their mistakes. And so, you know, many players don't get to dribble, you know, for, for four seconds, look at a defender. They're, you know, uh, coming off a, a pin down and they have one dribble and it's a half second decision. So trying to replicate, okay, this player doesn't quite have the processing speed or, or, you know, the process uh, or the ability to, to, uh, to, to have motor adaption in that moment. Let's recreate that moment, whether it's, you know, them uh, starting blind. So facing away from the play, they flip around and they have two steps, um, which is you know, an extremely fast decision. And then while working on the flexibility aspects of it, while working on shin angle and, and you know, the, the strengthening of the eccentric muscles. Um, last time we talked about, uh, you know, unique falls and uh, trying to, you know, in air, figure out whether it was going to be one or two. That same letting players solve their way out of mistakes in a way that, like, will replicate game settings is what I have, what I believe to be the best solution for many of these things. It's just that they kind of look funny or, um, you know, they may be things that you have to scrounge a little bit further down for. But I also think that uh, I've run a lot of Euro drills where a player, you know, Euro steps directly into me because I didn't do a good enough job of training them on what cues to read or didn't give me the opportunity to make like, real mistakes. And they were just doing sort of what they were told, which is a right foot and a long left step. Um, so that is that is a long winded answer to a to a very on point question. No, but I think it all makes sense, right? I think what you're getting at really here is a game is an open environment with lots of open variables and things you have to read. If you're only training it within that block closed environment, it's not going to really carry over to the game. Like, like you said, the player might just be thinking, oh, you know, I was told right, left. You know, that's, that's what they're going to stick to rather than, rather than figuring out 
why am I doing a right left? When am I doing the right left? Right. And that's where what you're talking about, some of the variability training really comes into play, allowing them to start processing what triggers am I using here for that? Yeah. Um, it goes back to the like apocryphal story about Rashid Wallace creating Spain uh, pick and roll um, yeah. in, a, in a North Carolina practice. And he, he messed up the play so bad that it turned into something beautiful. And they were like, wait, uh, what did you do? That was wrong. Oh, wait, can we run that again? And exactly. it's like, yeah, you like, uh, I mean, if she knows exactly where he's supposed to be, like maybe Caroline doesn't experiment with that. Like obviously the game, you know, would have still advanced no matter what, but those, those environments for positive failure and for unique failure um, where like you can really uh, pressurize strange decisions and, and enforce players to work on those processing skills because like a lot of times the player physically knows how to do it but it's just not they haven't solved their own way around it and and a if we want to foster the player's creativity i think that we also have to as as coaches or trainers or um, um you know uh, physical development movement skills have to breed that creativity into our drills yeah you, and i think you have to give a platform for the player to figure it out themselves. Of course, you're going to guide them on the way, but you know, me or you telling someone how to do it is far less impactful, but far less carryover than a player actually solving that themselves. Like, you know, the parallel I see is like, let's say, you know, the hardest classes I ever took are probably the ones I still remember the best because I had to really figure it out. I had to really, you know, just go through it and figure out and, and solve what the, what the problems were in that class. Whereas a different class where, you know, it, it wasn't quite as difficult or I was kind of just told the answers, whatever it is, you know, that stuff you just forget. But if you allow a player and you give them the environment to figure out some of this stuff through failure, and I think that's a key thing we, we will touch on in future topics is that you know, failure with the nervous, the nervous system loves failure because it's able to calibrate stuff off of that and figure out what works and what does not work. So I think a lot of times we look at a drill and a player doesn't do it right and they're frustrated about it. And a coach might be like, oh, you know, you didn't do it the right way. For me, when I see that, hey, that's a necessary step for you to eventually figure out some of these movements. So the way we frame mistakes, I think, as trainers, movement coaches is very, very important. Yeah, I mean, uh, drills that essentialize failure um, and and make failure unique are, I think, bear better results because a player is going to learn something about themselves. I may not like it in that moment, but it's, it's certainly going to be like, well, okay, so I may not have the hamstring flexibility to do the biggest step against a real defender in a, you know, in a tight stage. Okay, well, what can I do? Let me try something different this yep. time and something different this time. And, and that positive experimentation, um, knowing that like you've built something that's, I would say, like, intentionally somewhat cruel to, to success. Um, you know, uh, like, you know, doing a blind gyro step is really tough. You're, fl you're flipping in midair and you have to make it really quick to two step, um, especially if somebody's going fast slow, but that will probably, the player will probably have more ideas about what will be successful for them than teaching them five or six different options and just saying, okay, so this is, this is, uh, this is an inverse euro. This is a big, small euro. Uh, this is first step slow. This is second step fast. Like you've thrown a lot of them. They don't know if it's necessarily grafted. And it's not to say that doesn't have value. It's just the, the first step is, or the doing the first thing, doing the, here is the itinerary doesn't necessarily, um, it, it does not have a, a, a cooperative effect with the player and, and their interaction with their game. No, exactly. I, I think what you're getting at is that the key is really giving them the, the decision-making framework for, to be able to then apply that physical output. And that's really the key. And then, you know, one last thing is that we've seen in the research is that how a player feels like they did after a practice has no correlation with actual carryover. So, you know, I take a player through 15 uh, Euro steps, 15 jump shots, and they'll make all of them. They might feel great, right? But that doesn't have any real carryover to the game. And that speaks to what we just talked about in terms of how important failure is in terms of actual learning. So, you know, on that note, I think that's it for episode two. Again, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, PD, uh, if you want to just give a shout out to all the stuff that you're working on or, you know, where people can find you and then I'll take us out of here. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, these are honestly a highlight of my week. Um, you can find me on Twitter at above the break three. There's a link to my Patreon 
uh, where I do long form writing about skill development and, and basketball philosophy, along with the, you know some scouting. Um, uh, should have a piece on the development of movement shooting and its translation between other elements of shooting uh, in the next couple of days. Um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. And you know, if you're more interested in you know some of the skill stuff, PD stuff. It does a really good job of translating it, and that's kind of why I wanted to partner with him on this stuff. As for myself, you can find me you know, Twitter, social media, YouTube at 3CB Performance, 3 Charlie Beta Performance. I try to talk about you know movement skills as often as I can. Although with some of the injury rates these days, you know a lot of my videos have just been about injuries. But anyways, um, so that does it for this episode. You can find this on Spotify, Spotify find it on Apple as well. You know, give it a listen. If you find it to be worthwhile, give it a share, rate it, of course. And then, of course, I think from PD and I, most importantly, you know, give us any feedback you can on how to make these better, you know, each week. That's our goal is to give you a digestible way to understand some of this, you know, underlying what we call skill science. On that note, we're out of here and we'll see you all next week.